Hi, thanks for joining me today for our discussion on CTANE improvers. My name is Eric Bjornstad. I'm the Technical Information Director here at Bell Performance in Longwood, Florida. So CTANE improvers, we want to talk about uh, how they're used. We want to talk about the benefits that people get from using them. Uh, not just what's out there in the marketplace in terms of brand name A versus brand name B, but we really want to focus our attention more on the technical aspects that govern how and why CTANE improvers are used in the marketplace. So what we want to cover today is we want to cover some specific things in that vein. We want to talk about uh, things like the relationship between a fuel's CTANE rating and how it performs in an engine. We want to talk about why and when CTANE improvers would be appropriate to be used along, uh, along with what benefits they would bring when you use them. And we also want to touch on a little bit about some of the tests, some of the measurements that are used to quantify CTANE rating and to diagnose problems. So uh, to start off with, as we start uh, considering these technical aspects, we, we will start to use uh, certain terms that it may be good for you to be familiar with. So let's kick things off by uh, uh, giving some explanations about what some of these terms mean so that you'll have a little bit better context of the discussion later on. Okay, so um, the first three here, compression ignition. Okay, diesel engines use compression ignition in order to, uh, in order to operate. And of course that means mm -hmm. that they don't use a spark plug to ignite fuel. Specifically on the slide, it says that uh, rapid compression of the air within the engine cylinders generates the heat required to ignite the fuel. Now, you're, you're going to hear ignition quality referred to a number of times. Diesel engines rely on fuel having satisfactory ignition qual quality in order for it to work properly. So ignition quality is defined here as uh, the measure of ease in which uh, combustion is initiated uh, inside that engine. Um, cetane. Cetane is a universal expression of diesel fuel's ignition quality, right? But how do you quantify this concept in terms of ignition quality? When, you're, when, you're, when you've got two fuel samples and you have, you're comparing one to another and you say, well, this one has better ignition quality than this other one, well, that's a little bit of a, a overly conceptual term. You, what, what you really are trying to do is you're trying to uh, use this term ignition quality to express something a little bit more concrete. And in this case, ignition quality relates specifically to the measurement of the ignition delay within an engine. Now, ignition delay here, uh, you can see it refers to the period of time immediately after fuel injection. Uh, a diesel fuel that has an optimal ignition delay will be assumed to have the best combustion quality. And then cetane number, you're going to hear that, that term a lot. Cetane number is the index measurement that the industry uses to express the combustibility of the diesel fuel. They, they, they use it as an index expression of how readily the diesel fuel ignites. So up to this point, you've got these concepts and they might sound a little bit like Greek to you. So let's, let's illustrate them a little better with uh, a, a couple of visuals here. So first thing we wanna do is we'll start by uh, illustrating uh, the, the four stroke diesel engine combustion process. Um, you see the four strokes, you see the four phases here, air, air intake, compression, expansion, and exhaust. So as you can see, uh, this is just a cutaway of a combustion uh, cylinder area. Uh, you've got the piston here. It's being driven up and down by this crankshaft that's being turned. Um, and then up here, you have the combustion chamber where the air fuel mixture is. And, and then you have valves. And you have an intake valve and then you have an exhaust valve. So uh, what happens first is the air intake stroke. Um, air comes in, this valve opens, air comes in and starts uh, uh, coming in here. Um, and uh, the fuel is also injected at the same time. So the air is starting to mix with the fuel in here. And at this point, 
all the while this is happening, this piston is driving upwards. And as it drives upwards towards the com transitioning into the compression stroke, you can see that it is starting to compress the volume of air inside the uh, combustion chamber. And so what happens, practically speaking, is that the pressure the, 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 the pressure of this gas is going to rise, right? The air gets compressed. Uh, this is moving up towards the, the top dead cylinder point, the point at which it tops out. Uh, and so when it reaches top dead center or is very, very close to where when that happens, that fuel is going to ignite. The fuel like mixture is going to ignite and it's going to explode. And when this happens, it's going to generate pressure waves and the air inside of the combustion chamber is going to expand rapidly. And those two things will push the cylinder back down. And that is what's going to help drive the engine and enable it to do work, in which case is moving the vehicle from point A to point B or doing whatever else the engine was designed for. Um, then the last stroke is exhaust. The piston is on its way back down. The fuel air mixture is now spent, and that means that the exhaust um, valve opens and the, the, the spent fuel air mixture goes out and the, the, the whole system readies itself for a repeat. It goes back to the air intake and it happens all over again. And all of this, of course, happens really, really, really quickly, hundreds of times. Um, you know, well, actually, I should say, um, I'm, I can't say hundreds of times a second, but multiple times uh, a second. All of this is happening uh, pretty quickly. So uh, here you can see a, a couple of other diagrams which are going to be useful uh, or illuminating uh, as we talk about what happens inside of a combustion chamber with fuel ignition. Now, what these diagrams depict, these two diagrams here, diagram one and diagram two, these are graphs of what's happening to the air pressure inside of the cylinder as the piston moves up and down. Um, what you should be able to take away from these, what you should be able to see is that as the pressure rises and the pressure rises because the cylinder is going up and, and up towards top dead center and it's compressing that gas, uh, as the pressure rises, um, you can see, at, well, actually I've got it flipped. As the piston moves towards top dead center from here to here, you can see that the pressure rises. And that makes sense. We just saw in the other diagram that the piston moving up makes that volume smaller, and so the pressure increases. Now, the other thing that you should be able to see both here and here, which is another expression of the same graph, albeit in a different way, what you should be able to see is that even after the piston hits top dead center, which is here and here, you can see that the the pressure of the, the gas inside of that cylinder continues to rise. Okay, so now we want to look at this one. This should kind of wrap this all up and enable you to, to see the overall point of what we're trying to illustrate here. This is where things get a little bit more interesting. Now, again, this is another diagram. shows the relationship between cylinder pressure on the y-axis and time, or relative to, shall we say, piston position um, on the x-axis. Now, um, we have essentially what this shows is a comparison of three different types of events. This one, this one, and this one. Now, this one here is an illustration of what happens to the piston pressure or the, pre the, the air pressure inside of the cylinder when no fuel is being injected, when there's no fuel being injected, when there's, no, uh, there's nothing exploding. This is just a, a baseline illustration of what happens to the air pressure when the piston just goes up and down and just compresses air inside of that cylinder. So what you see is the black line is hidden behind here, but as the piston's going up, but up a bell curve. The piston goes up, compresses the gas, so the pressure is rising, and it's rising some. It's not rising a huge amount. But here is where the piston reaches top dead center, and here is where the pressure tops out. And then the piston is now going back down, and as you can see, the other half of the bell curve 
the pressure uh, is also going back down. And so you've got a nice, you know, even uniform bell curve here. Okay, now let's add fuel into the mixture. Now, um, what we've got with the other two lines is a comparison of what happens when you have different injection delays. Now, you remember a couple slides ago, we mentioned injection delay. Well, this is where we get to see how it, how it works from a practical standpoint. See, what happens is, you know, the piston's moving and it's on its way up. And at some point, the fuel will be injected. And for our purposes, it's injected here. Now, what happens in all diesel engines is a, there is a delay. There's a period of time that elapses between when the fuel is injected here and when the, the fuel actually ignites. And depending on if that, that injection delay is long or short, that will actually affect how the pressure manifests itself inside of that cylinder. So uh, let's take fuel with a good cetane rating. Fuel that has a good cetane rating uh, or adequate cetane rating for the design of the engine will have a shorter uh, uh, injection delay. So the fuel gets injected here, and then you have a relatively short delay, and it starts to combust here. Now, the red line is what illustrates what happens with good cetane fuel. We'll call it good cetane fuel for our purposes here. So the fuel explodes and the pressure starts to rise pretty rapidly and it's rising. Meanwhile, remember the piston's still going up. Here's where the piston reaches top dead center. The, pist the, the, the fuel, uh, excuse me, the pressure continues to rise. It tops out like this um, and then goes back down. And that's basically, you know, the illustration of what happens. Now, if you compare that to fuel that has poor cetane, uh, inadequate cetane rating will mean that the injection delay is longer. In other words, uh, if you think about it, cetane actually speeds up uh, combustion and it shortens the injection delay. So if you don't have enough cetane, you get the opposite. The injection delay is longer. And here's how that looks by this black line right here. Fuel's injected, piston keeps going. Instead of it igniting here like it's supposed to, it's gonna wait, 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 wait. Okay, now it's starting to combust. And so what you end up happening here is the pressure rises as you would expect but it rises at a higher rate, it roots more sharply, and it rises at a, to a higher level than the good cetane fuel did. And then it goes back down. Now, practically, you, know, you can see the difference between this line and this line. You can see that difference, but what does that mean practically inside the engine? Well, the takeaway here, the basic takeaway interpretation of, of this whole picture here is that when fuel is deficient in cetane, it has a longer induction delay and that results in a faster and sharper, uh, may even say a rougher pressure rise. And that is not what's going to help an engine run at peak efficiency. What will help the engine be run peak at peak efficiency is this kind of pressure rise, not this kind. Okay, so how do you measure cetane number? We already established that. Uh, you know, cetane is this expression of combustibility or of, of, uh, of fuel combustibility, but how is it measured? Well, the, um, the, the, the most universally accepted cetane measurement test for a long time has been the ASTM D613. Um, I think they, they, it's also referred to as a Cooperative Fuel Research Committee test or CFR test. Now, uh, what this basically is, it's a special kind of engine. It's a single cylinder. It's a four-stroke cycle, just like we were looking at earlier. And it has the ability to have its compression ratio uh, altered. It's a variable compression ratio engine. And basically what they do is they take uh, diesel fuel and they inject it into the cylinder and they adjust the compression ratio while trying to uh, see how the, uh, the the injection delay matches the readings of other reference fuels. Uh, it can be a little bit more complicated than that, but for our purposes, that's basically what you need to know. So they compare how the fuel does uh, in that engine as compared to 
some different reference fuels. Um, the two most important reference fuels, just for your information, are N-cetane, which has a cetane number of 100, which means it's got a really high cetane number. And then there's another one that's used that has a cetane number of 15. Uh, and they, 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 they take the results of the, you know, whatever fuel they're testing and they plug it into a, a formula uh, and they, and, and so they get a cetane number in a cetane number reading. And it's, it's basically, if you think about it, it is an expression on that scale of how, uh, how well it combusts relative to a really, really good fuel and a really, really bad fuel. And so that's basically how they get cetane number. Okay. Now, in contrast to the D613 number, and there's also another uh, more updated number. Uh, I, don't, I do not remember what the AST number is specifically, but there's another number that use, uses updated equipment basically. But you know, those two kinds of tests are used to measure actual cetane number. Now, in contrast to this, there's a shortcut method of estimating the cetane rating, and that's called the cetane index. Um, cetane index does not involve any kind of measurements using special equipment or special kinds of cetane engines, anything like that. It is a calculation that's based on the results of a couple of other different tests, namely the distillation uh, test and the density. So they take the fuel density and they look at the distillation recovery temperature and they plug it into a formula and they get in C, they get a cetane index estimation now it has its usefulness for certain things but we have to be mindfulness of the limitations that it has too now um the 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 benefit of it is that it gives you a quick and dirty estimation of the cetane rating Okay, it's relatively easy to do. You don't need any specialized equipment. Uh, you know, measuring the density of the fuel and doing a distillation test is standard operating procedure for any laboratory that's worth anything. You're real easy to do, and uh, concurrently, they're inexpensive to do. It's not going to cost you very much to do a cetane index test. Um, the limitation, though. The big limitation that we have to be mindful for our purposes is that cetane index does not account, as you can see on the last point here, it does not account for the presence or the effect of any cetane improver. So what you would not be able to do is you would not be able to take a, a fuel, an untreated fuel, run a cetane index test, you get its, its base cetane number. Now that is, that's a legitimate number there. Okay, so you've got a good starting point. However, then you, you know, let's say that the cetane index test comes back and it's 39. That would be really, really low. In fact, that would be below the legal limit. So they say, okay, we need to add some cetane improver or something to improve the cetane uh, rating of get it at least above 40. So they add some kind of cetane improver and they get it, you know, they add enough that they, it should go up to let's say 45, but they run another cetane index test on the treated fuel and they get something, but whatever they get is not going to be what they think it is because it's not going to be a legitimate after measurement because the cetane index, because it measures, because it estimates based on gravity and distillation temperature, the adding, it's not going to be able, it's basically not going to be able to detect that you've added that cetane improver. So that's the big limitation of a cetane index test. It's useful in providing a, uh, essentially a starting point, the kind of the base number estimation. But in order to see how a, a cetane additive or something else really affected the cetane rating, you would need to actually run a full-blown cetane rating test. So that's just an important thing to keep in mind. All right, well, we've already hinted at this, but what are the ways to improve the cetane rating in the fuel? Okay, um, luck, we, we say luckily for us, it's fairly easy to fix a cetane problem because there are some very good cetane increasing additives that are easy to apply to the fuel and which have very noticeable, um, uh, very, very fast, very noticeable effects. 
Now, the two most commonly used additives are 2-EHN, 2-ethylhexyl nitrate, and this DTBP compound, di-tertiary butyl peroxide. Now, 2-EHN is more commonly used, and that's what we use in our cetane improver. And it, it's, a, it's probably the, 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 the dominant solution out there in the marketplace. Now, remember that what's the basic effect? How is acetane improver going to work? How's it going to do what it needs to do? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to reduce the injection delay. It's going to reduce the time between fuel injection and the, and the start of combustion of that fuel. And so it's going to even out that pressure rise and it's going to have a number of, um, a, a, a number of noticeable and significant effects uh, inside of that engine. Now, um, how much does it affect the ignition delay? Remember, ignition delay is the quanti is essentially the quantifiable expression of combustibility. So, how does having a higher cetane number? Uh, what, what does that benefit really look like in terms of what's really being measured? Well, this is a useful uh, illustration of the relationship between fuel cetane number and ignition delay. Now, ignition delays measured in milliseconds. So when we talk about ignition delay, we're not talking about any large period of time. Uh, in fact, it would be it would be uh, the the difference between 5.5 milliseconds and 2.5 milliseconds would be imperceptible to the human ear. Luckily, we don't use human ears to measure this. We use computers, so that's good. So what what you can see is this is a pretty you know a pretty clear uh, logarithmic curve here. Um, uh, you know, remember that the minimum legal cetane is 40. And so if you were to go over, let's say that 40, you're going to have about a five. That up to 60, which would be pretty high, practically speaking, well, you've reduced the ignition delay from five down to somewhere in the low threes. And that is significant when you're talking about how the engine works. So as we've said, uh, we Bell Performance offers uh, a, a very good cetane improver that uses 2-ethylhexyl nitrate, and our cetane improver is called Supertane. We have uh, two different formulations of it. Uh, this was introduced in 2007, and our primary uh, uh, improver formulation, the, just the regular mm -hmm. Supertane formulation, it's an aftermarket product and has a the base treat rate that's recommended is one to a thousand. Now we do have a concentrated version of the of, of the same product called Supertane RB. Uh, our RB products are RB stands for refinery blend, and basically what that designation means is. It's intended, it's, they're more concentrated and they're intended for bulk fuel treatment. What that means from a sales standpoint is that we do not package the RB formulations in bottles. And, you know, we do not have 32 ounce bottle of Supertain RB that is available for the average consumer to buy and put in their vehicle or for the average, uh, you know, somebody to put in a small storage tank. RB formulations are are really marketed and formulated for large amounts of fuel. So they're only sold in 55 gallon drums and up. But both the Supertain and the RB, they do exactly the same thing. They're just one's more concentrated than the other. Um, we also have the uh, Cetane Improver blended into the multifunctions, Diesel and Diesel Plus. Now, because of the nature of the multifunctions, mm -hmm. These all and these all plus are not going to have as much cetane improver in them as the regular supertane will, but there will be it. There is certainly enough in these two formulations. Typically, you get about a two point increase, whereas with supertane and supertane RB, you're going to get more along the lines of four to six, maybe even eight, depending on the fuel. So. Um, these all and these all plus formulations have cetane improver in them in order to provide that benefit. Now, what is the expected level of increase that you could uh, expect to see with these kind of cetane improvers? Now, we did just list off some numbers, but um, we wanted to go into a little bit more depth about that because there are us. The, there's a couple of conceptual things that it's important to understand if you're going to have a complete understanding of how cetane improvers work. Now, look at uh, this representation here. 
you've got a couple of diff you've got three different low sulfur diesel uh, uh, formulations here uh, sample a sample B and sample C now um, the different graphs the green uh, is the base so one was a 44 and a half one's a 43 uh, you know one's a 41 and they took and they added varying levels of cetane improver 500 ppm uh, 1,000 ppm and 1,500 ppm. Now, what you should the what, what you should be able to see a couple of different things. Obviously, what you would expect to happen is that the more cetane improver you add, the greater the benefit you get. The higher the the increase in cetane number, and that is you know that's obviously borne out by what you're seeing here. But what you should also be able to see, if you look at A, B, and C, and just look at the difference between the green and the orange. This one increased by four numbers at 500 ppm. This one increased by three numbers at the same 500 ppm. This one increased by 3.7. Um, if you look at the red and the green, this one, when they doubled the amount, it went from three increase to 4.9 increase. This went from uh, you know 3.7 to 5.2. Uh, the main takeaway that you should be able to see here is that different fuel samples give different, they, they essentially react differently and they give different responses to cetane improver, such as measured by their cetane number increase. And that we, we, I think that this is an even better illustration of this because this actually takes into account hundreds and hundreds of fuel samples that were tested at all different um, uh, uh, concentrations of cetane number improvement anywhere from well zero up you know 250 750 1500 up to 2000 and what you can see here this is an excellent illustration of the point that we're trying to drive home here different it, it's hard to predict uh, from the onset exactly how a fuel is going to respond some fuels respond, uh, you know, are considered good response fuels. In other words, you add a certain amount of cetane number in improver and their cetane number increases by a lot. Some other fuels, you could add the same amount and they could have a poor response. You know, like let's look at 1,000 ppm, okay? 1,000 ppm and, and that's concentration in the finished fuel. A, there, you could have uh, two fuel samples that look the same and that you would think are the same in every respect. But when you treat them, one of theirs only increases by, let's say, two cetane numbers. So you only get a two increase. That's a poor response. You can have another one at exactly the same amount of cetane improver, and it increases by, you know, six. That's a good response, and that's a significant difference between a two and a six. Now, the average that you might expect based on the bulk of the information is somewhere, you know, maybe close to four. That would be an average response. What, what, what you should take away from this is that fuel response can vary. If you want to be absolutely sure how a fuel, given fuel stream was going to respond, uh, you would actually take a sample of that fuel and then you would treat it and you would see what the response was. But from a predictive standpoint, there can be there can be variation all over the map. And unfortunately, um, some unscrupulous formulators take advantage of this by basically assuming the absolute top of the the response range, or maybe even higher. And so they come out with these these additives. You know, then they may be multifunction additives, and they may claim to do you know seven different things at really low treat rates. And they might, and one of the things, specific claims that they might give is increases cetane by eight points. Well, what's their justification? Well, they look at this right up here and they say, well, we're going to assume all fuels respond like this when it's very obvious that, that that's really just downright untrue. All fuels do not respond like that. And the majority, the vast majority of people are not going to get anything like an eight increase at this treat rate. They're probably going to get a three or, you know, a four or something like that. And there's a big difference between a four and an eight in this respect. So, um, cetane improvers, we've said this before, ha are somewhat unique in that 
the fuel's response to them and the benefits that are seen for the end user are pretty immediately noticeable. Now, uh, that's what we want to talk about on the next few slides here. We want to talk about the kind of situations that would be appropriate to consider using cetane improvers in. And then we want to talk about what are the specific field level benefits that somebody would get. Um, you can see these points here. We don't need to read these word for word, but basically, um, you know, if somebody wants to increase the, the if, if there's, if you are a fuel distributor, if this is a B2B situation and you're a fuel distributor and you have a premium diesel package, you would, you would consider adding a cetane improver to that in order to make it even more valuable. Uh, you would also consider adding cetane improvers if you want to differentiate yourself from others. Uh, if you need certain emissions goals that you need uh, to meet, that's a big, big one in, in today's because especially with groups like urban users, uh, underground mines, especially underground mines, they have big problems sometimes meeting emission-specific target goals. Well, cetane improvers can definitely help you with that. Um, at the refinery level, cetane improvers are definitely a, a significant part of the additive business that refineries use. Now, specific benefits here. Let's talk about some of these specific benefits and kind of conceptualize this, make this a little bit more specific from a conceptual standpoint. Okay, there are, yeah, let's see, six, seven, maybe eight uh, kinds of benefits that cetane improver uh, that you should be able to see. Number one here is cold weather starting. Um, this is not nearly as big of an issue now with diesels as they were in the past because there's technology that uh, warms the engine up faster. But in the olden days, if you had poor cetane diesel, it could take you a long time to start your diesel engine because the diesel engine relies on latent heat in order to, you know, relies on building up latent heat in the cylinder to reach that auto ignition temperature. It didn't have a spark plug to help it do that. A mm -hmm. uh, 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 good cetane fuel, fuels with high enough cetane rating reach that point faster. You can get reduced fuel consumption and reduced exhaust emissions. These two are big ones. The fuel consumption, everybody wants mm -hmm. fuel consumption. And if you have poor cetane fuel, if you, bring, if you bring that cetane rating up to what it's supposed to, you know, you could get a two, two, three, maybe 4% improvement. And that is definitely something that's gonna interest a lot of people. Uh, you definitely get reduced exhaust emissions. We're going to see exactly how much here in a little bit. But exhaust emissions, anything having to do with how well the fuel burns, you will have improvement in those areas if you use a cetane improver. Uh, you'll get less white smoke. That, technically, that is an emission. Uh, again, reduced warm-up time. And then the whole reduced noise and improved engine durability. The engine operates smoother and it, it, you know, the roughness of the engine is leveled out and it's less noisy because fuel combustion is happening uh, more completely at the right time in the process for that engine. So we said emissions. Now, a lot of people talk about, you know, "Quote unquote improving emissions." Well, we want to we we want to provide some specific data so you can see exactly the effect that cetane number improvers have on uh, different kinds of emissions. So what you're going to see, you're going to see uh, effect of CN. That's effect of fuel cetane number relative to a certain kind of emission. In this case, the first one is hydrocarbon emissions. HC is the is the kind of the industry term. Uh, abbreviation that's used for unburned hydrocarbon emissions. And what you should be able to see here uh, is that you've got kind of a flat logarithmic line where as cetane number increases along the x-axis, you've got the y-axis is the measurement of the HC emissions in terms of grams per brake horsepower per hour. So that all that has been controlled. And what you can see is that the line kind of follows a nice smooth curve and it, it starts to flatten out, uh, you know, somewhere right down here. But basically you see that there is a reasonably good difference between the HC emissions seen with a 40 cetane fuel and one that's seen with a 44 cetane fuel or even down to a 52. Now, um, carbon monoxide emissions. Carbon monoxide is 
uh, a reflection of incomplete combustion. If you get if you have optimal complete combustion of a hydrocarbon, you will get water and carbon dioxide. But if for some reason you don't have enough oxygen or you have something in the engine that's preventing complete combustion, then you'll get carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is really, really bad for air quality. So what's the, uh, the effect? Well, again, uh, carbon monoxide emissions measured here, cetane number measured here. What you can see is that the, the, the level of carbon monoxide emissions goes down steadily as carbon monoxide, excuse me, as cetane number increases until you get around, let's say, 53 or so, and then it kind of flattens out. But there's a substantial difference between the emissions here and the emissions here, which is the minimum cetane rating. What about NOx, NOx, nitrous oxide emissions? Nitrous oxide emissions are considered, well, we said CO emissions were really bad. These are considered really, really bad, especially for young children, which is, so the, they're really concerned about controlling NOx emissions in urban settings. As you can see, again, as you increase the cetane number, you get this curve that gives you substantial and regular decrease in NOx emissions until you get around, you know, 53 or so. So same kind of curve. In fact, this curve looks almost identical to the curve of the, uh, the previous slide. So it's the same type of benefit. Now, PM, PM is particulate matter. PM is basically, PM is that soot that you used to see coming out of the stacks of these big diesel engines, that black soot. Um, PM is different from all of these other ones in that, as you can readily see, it is a flat mm -hmm. linear line, which means as CT number increases all the way up through here, uh, the, the particulate matter emissions goes down steadily, and it doesn't matter if you're going from 48 to 52 mm -hmm. or 42 to 46, it's virtually the same rate of drop. Um, how much drop is it? Well, if you measure uh, the particulate matter emissions at 40 and you compare them to the particulate matter emissions at 48, which is probably a premium diesel fuel, you've got about a 15% difference. Now, how does this compare to the other emissions? A 15% drop. Well, for hydrocarbons, the first one we looked at, which had that logarithmic curve, it was a 49% drop. For carbon monoxide, it was a 40% drop. So the drop is not as high through those numbers as with carbon monoxide and HC. But when you, the more you increase cetane number up through here, you do get a higher benefit. And the, the one thing that you should be able to see for all of them is that no matter which one you're talking about, increasing cetane number in that fuel gives you a positive reduction in whatever kind of emission you're looking at. And then the last emission we're looking at, white smoke. White smoke is indicative of incomplete combustion. And they measured this as, I believe they measured this as an optical percentage you can see that this is probably the sharpest curve out of all of them. You can see that, um, you know, even starting, even just up around, you know, even above 40, let's say 45 and a half, um, you can see that as you, de as you increase the fuel cetane rating up to 46, and then to 50, the line, you know, the level of white smoke down here is probably, what, 12%, whereas the level up here is, 70%. So really, really substantial reductions uh, in white smoke emissions as you increase cetane number. And then lastly, we said that adding a cetane improver will make the engine run more smoothly. Well, we can measure in terms of noise, noise reduction measured in decibels. And as you can see, two different sets of results, whether you're at medium or medium speed, low load, which is the blue, or high speed, high load. As you increase cetane number from let's say 45 up to 55, you can see you know pretty good reductions, about a 10 to 15 percent reduction just in raw noise for both the high speed and the medium speed engines. Enough that it is definitely going to be noticeable for the operator and everyone around them. So, uh, just to touch very briefly on refineries. 
Um, you know, refineries is not something that is a, a big vertical for us because we're pro probably not as competitive from a financial standpoint as we would like to be. Um, refineries operate on extremely tight margins where you look at fractions like hundreds of a cent matter for these folks. But uh, in the interest of knowing, you, you know, the complete picture of the market, it is useful to have at least briefly touch on some of the considerations that refineries and fuel refiners uh, take into consideration when they're considering cetane improvers. What kind of benefits will those kind of people get from cetane treatment? Well, it allows them to be more flexible to do a lot of, of things that they need to do in order to produce what they need to produce. The big one for me is this one. It allows them greater flexibility to take different kinds of stocks like uh, light cycle oils, for example, and it allows them to blend those in the diesel fuel and come away with a, a, an end product that meets cetane specification. That is extremely important for refineries. That's one of the biggest reasons why they use them. Um, they use them because second point says doing this is more economical than running this stuff through a hydro treater to, to try and chemically tra uh, 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 change its composition and increase its cetane number that way. So refineries have a pretty clear picture of how they need to use cetane improvers. Um, as we bring this down the home stretch, we have a few other uh, important facts and considerations that, that we need to remember to mention here. Um, we've already established, first and foremost, we established earlier that fuels vary in response to CTA number improvers. That's what CNI means. So you can have a fuel that, you can have two fuels, two diesel fuels, treated with exactly the same amount of cetane improver. Now, we're assuming these are from different feedstocks, not from the same barrel. We're not, we're not saying that. But two, two fuel samples, both of which say number two diesel, but one might have come from one refinery and one might have come from another. And they could have very different responses to the same number of cetane number improver. One might increase by four. The other one might increase by six and a half. And in the grand scheme of things, that's a substantial difference. The only way to really nail down uh, the response is to test the individual fuel samples and run an actual cetane number test, not an index test, but a number test. Uh, second thing is that cetane improver 2EHN, which is supertane, it can have an adverse effect on a couple of fuel properties, the thermal stability and the lubricity level. Now, that being said, the, the good news in this is that if those are being used alongside a stability additive and or a lubricity additive, those additives will very easily erase any of these degradation effects that the cetane improver uh, brings. So it's a minor consideration that's pretty easily fixed. And then lastly, um, we just need to be reminded that cetane standards are changing. Um, the minimum spec for cetane for a long time has been 40. Um, but that's only in the United States. In Europe, the minimum, uh, you know, as of the time of, of, of pu putting together this, uh, this training, it was 45, but it's entirely possible that it's going to be moving closer to 50. Um, Japanese diesel specifications are different. Uh, even within the United States, I believe California is moving towards a 50 or more. So the diesel uh, the minimum specs for cetane rating for diesel are moving up and up and up and up. So with that consideration, um, that's going to, that, that means that the market for supertane is going to stay pretty robust for, you know, for at least the foreseeable future, because it is a good treatment. It has excellent environmental effects. Engines need cetane, proper cetane rating in their uh, uh, fuels. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good product. Um, and then last point here, uh, remember that uh, there's a limited amount of extra benefit that cetane improvers can impart to an engine that doesn't need additional cetane improvement. So it's not a case where uh, more is always better. You know, you do need to know a little bit about what your, your, your engine actually needs. Um, 
And, you know, that can be a combination of looking in the owner's manual, considering that, you know, if it's a high use engine that's gotten old and it's got deposits in it, um, you know, the conditions within that engine may have changed such that it needs a higher cetane fuel regardless of what the manufacturer statement said it needed when it was new. So in review, um, we've established that cetane improvers are really, really useful for improving engine performance in a number of different areas. And Bell Performance luckily has a couple of formulations couple of different concentrations of cetane improver, both of which are under the supertain name. Regular supertain has a 1 to 1,000 base treat rate. Supertain RB is for bulk treatment, available in 55-gallon drums and larger, and it can be used at 1 to 5,000. So that concludes our discussion about cetane improvers. I hope that you got a lot out of it, especially with respect to the technical information regarding uh, the levels of benefit that cetane improvers can impart. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, my email is here on this slide, ebjornstead at bellperformance.net. Feel free to drop me a line, send me an email, uh, reference that you were watching the cetane improver training, you had some questions, I will do my best to get it back to you as soon as possible. So thanks very much for joining me. Hope you got a lot out of it. And uh, we'll see you next time.